Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Uh, we will continue with our lessons on tenses. Uh, in the previous uh, lesson, we had introduced tenses and how they transform under general coordinate transformation. Today, we will look at the case how tenses transform in special relativity. Now, in special relativity, we know that uh, the coordinates uh, belong to some particular uh, frame and uh, we normally just consider the case of the inertial frames. So the inertial frames uh, have their own coordinates and uh, going from one frame to another will involve change of coordinates. So and uh, we have already mentioned that uh, the case of the Lorentz transformation is essentially a linear transformation between one coordinate system to another. And this essentially preserves straight lines. Hence, we have this particular uh, linear transformation for our Lorentz transformation. So your L is essentially your Lorentz matrix previously, and your A is just the inhomogeneous part. Now, Remember in the, in the previous lesson that we, we wanted to do a Jacobian matrix and we do a coordinates transformation. So in this particular case, the, the Jacobian matrix gets simpler because of the linearity of this transformation. So if we just uh, take the derivative of the uh, x mu dash with respect to the undashed coordinates, we will get back to your Lorentz matrices. So in other words, what we will have is that uh, your tensors in general, uh, this is in this particular case, is this uh, uh, rank M, uh, contravariant rank M tensor with uh, covariant rank N. They will transform as tensors according to the Lorentz transformation by this multiplication of, of, of a series of Lorentz matrices. Uh, the Lorentz matrices are given here, and the other part will be involving the inverse Lorentz transformation. So once it's uh, behaved in this way, we call this as a four tensor. The label four rep represents the four dimensionality of the space time. Now uh, let give us a, let's do an example. Uh, we look at the relative position four vector with respect to a fixed point, and let's call the fixed point as x naught. So x naught will have four components, just like your general uh, points will have four components. And uh, if we take how this uh, transform according to the Lorentz transformation. So you have this uh, Lorentz transformation for your x mu dash and then the Lorentz transformation for your x naught mu dash. And you can see that uh, this inhomogeneous part will drop off and we are left with the Lorentz matrix multiplying the difference between the, uh, the two uh, axes, um, which is essentially the, the related position. Uh, normally, we choose this uh, x naught to be your origin of your uh, coordinate system. So you won't be able to see this. So in general, we can say that the position for vector is the uh, contravariant for vector. Uh, contravariant referring to the upper index. Now, let's look at the, the other thing that we did in special relativity is to introduce Minkowski metric. So Minkowski matrix is a tensor uh, with two indices. So and these indices appear in, at the bottom. So it's a covariant rank two tensor. And we shall show this that they uh, transform as a four tensor according to the Lorentz transform. So let's recall what we had earlier. 
when we introduce this metric tensor, the metric tensor uh, obey what we call the Lorentz uh, condition, which is given by this equation. So uh, we shall use this equation, and we shall also use the inverse transformation. And remember, the inverse transformation is just the opposite. If you look at the index that appears here, the dash appears on top, and the, the undashed one appears at the bottom. So the inverse will have the, the reverse. So you have the undashed at top and the, 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 the dash at the bottom. So this inverse transformation, when you multiply with the, the Lorentz transformation itself, will actually give you the identity, which gives you this Kronecker uh, uh, delta, similarly in this way. Now, we shall use this inverse transformation okay, and multiply this on the left-hand side in such a way that uh, when it gets contracted with these two Lorentz matrices on the right-hand side, they form the identity. And what happens this, after that uh, you can make the contraction with the Kronecker delta, and you'll find that, okay, you'll get your Minkowski metric in the dash coordinates. So in other words, if you, if you look at this part of the equation, must equal to that part of the equation, which is essentially saying that, okay, this is your metric tensor in the dash coordinate and they transform to the undash coordinates in this following manner, which is essentially the four tensor transformation law. Now in general this will not work because uh, here what we had was just the linear uh, transformation of the Lorentz transformation. So uh, Let's move on and uh, we introduce another object. Remember the metric is actually a covariant rank 2 tensor. Now we will try to, to think of uh, another object which is the inverse of this covariant rank 2 tensor. So in other words, uh, it will be something uh, like this. When it gets multiplied with your metric tensor, it should give you the identity. So in other words, this is what we call uh, an inverse metric. Okay. So and if you look at this, and you'll find that your indices are actually on top. So uh, the thing that we are saying now is essentially that this inverse metric is a contravariant tensor of rank 2. And we can simply just uh, proceed to show that by, by just taking the uh, matrix equation yeah, yeah, rather than working with the, the indices and take the inverse of this equation and that gives you this which you can uh, use the fact that uh, when you take the inverse you, you do the opposite ordering and hence you'll be able to write it down in this particular form when you, when you insert the indices. So in other words, what we have actually done here is to show that this inverse matrix is, is obeying the transformation law for contravariant for answer. Right. So, Now, as matrices, uh, you have seen earlier that uh, your metric tensor, the Minkowski metric tensor, uh, is just a, a diagonal matrix, uh, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. You remember that this is actually referring to the fourth component, the time component. Well, uh, if we just simply uh, deduce from, from the previous equation, you'll find that the inverse matrix is just the same thing. So when you multiply these two 
matrices together, you essentially get your identity. Now, let's think of uh, something else. Uh, remember that uh, the inverse, the sorry, the metric. Uh, in the past, we have actually uh, said it as a, an object that gives you the four-dimensional interval squared. So we want to be able to see how, uh, what are the other, uh, what you call, operations that can get from uh, the metric tensor as well as the inverse metric tensor. One of the things that we can actually show or propose is essentially uh, to write down this, uh, what you call, equation over here and notice that in this part of this equation uh, the free index is just your mu on top and the dummy index is contracted over to your four vector a the covariant four vector a so in other words whatever is the resultant of this uh, contraction will be uh, another vector with, uh, uh, with a single index on top. And this is what we call the contravariant four vector corresponding to the covariant four vector. So in other words, uh, what the inverse metric does is actually to raise the index of the covariant four vector. We can do the same thing and uh, using the metric tensor instead of over here you see that this inverse metric raise the index then uh, your metric tensor will actually lower the index so in other words what we have actually done is to be able to to form duals of vectors either from a covariant vector to give you a contravariant vector or a contravariant vector to a covariant vector. And it would be nice for us to understand what's the difference between the two. Now, if you just simply use the inverse metric earlier, okay, right, component-wise, you'll be able to show that the first three uh, components, the spatial components, they are just the same thing. But the fourth component gets a minus sign. Now, this is in contrast with the Euclidean geometry that we had earlier. So in Euclidean geometry, your upper index and your lower index behave in a similar way. So this is again uh, the thing that I've mentioned earlier, that you can actually use the metric tensor to lower the index of a contravariant vector. Now, if you do repeatedly, you will see that, okay, uh, in the end, you get a triviality over here because of your metric tensor multiplying your inverse metric. So you can just follow through this equation. Now, it's not necessarily just for the covariant vector or contravariant vector. You can do this index lowering or raising operations to any tensor. So here's an example. You have, uh, in this case, is a uh, contravariant rank 1 tensor. Uh, it's a covariant rank 2 and contravariant rank 1 tensor. It gets transformed to uh, uh, okay. It gets transformed in this particular manner that uh, one of your Covariant index gets raised and your uh, upper index rho gets lowered down. And how you can do this is just to introduce the appropriate uh, inverse metric and the metric tensor. So you can do all this uh, index gymnast gymnastic to, to for you to do certain uh, algebraic manipulations later on. Here's one convenient thing to see, 
a contraction between a, a covariant vector and a contravariant vector. And what can be done is to, okay, uh, I can think of your B mu here is actually coming from a covariant vector using the index uh, raising operator by the inverse metric. And similarly, I can think of your what you call A mu here, the covariant vector here, the index being lowered here by the action of a metric on a contravariant forward. And uh, what happens over here that you will see that this is just the same thing as this. Okay. In fact, uh, this is expected because over here what we had is essentially a scalar. And this is also a scalar. And uh, the full expression of this is just simply the following. So it's just like a dot product, but uh, there's a sign difference at the fourth component. So if you remember uh, in Euclidean uh, geometry, we had a dot product uh, for which if you take uh, two actors, uh, dot product together, you get uh, zero. And we say that those two actors are orthogonal. We'll do the same here by saying that the two actors are said to be orthogonal if you take the contraction between uh, a covariant vector and the, contra the corresponding contravariant vector to be equal to zero. And this is possible to have a much more general uh, idea uh, than the one in Euclidean geometry because of the sign difference over here. So in other words, uh, you have uh, something else happening uh, where you can get uh, one kind of vector uh, multiplying another, which are actually orthogonal in this sense, but they are not quite orthogonal in the Euclidean sense. Let me just show this. Now, perhaps the best thing to look at is how we do an inner product of the vector with itself. Now, generally, uh, in the case of a Euclidean metric, you'll find that, that this has to be a square, so it's always positive. But in this particular case, you have this negative part. So in other words, there's a possibility that this uh, dot product, so-called, can have three different values. If this is much more than that, then you have a A mu, a, a mu uh, greater than zero, and we define that as a space-like vector. Sorry. And uh, you can also have uh, a situation for which this quantity is equal to this quantity. And for that, you have this uh, inner product to be equal to zero. And this is what we call a light light vector or a null vector and lastly it could happen that this is actually less than this quantity in that particular case you have the inner product to be negative and your vector is said to be a time light so you can see some difference between the case of Euclidean geometry with with this particular uh, geometry of special relativity. So the splitting of the four vectors actually gives you the what we call the light constructure in special relativity. So uh, a space light vector will appear outside the light cone and uh, a light light vector or a null vector will appear on the surface of the cone. 
while as uh, a time light vector is actually uh, a vector that that is inside the cone. In fact, uh, you'll see later on that the light light vector is just uh, those uh, behaving like uh, photons. So you remember that photons will actually obey that uh, the fact that uh, write this thing down dx square plus dy square plus dz square equals c square t square and this is always true and this is always true for light so when you put down this into your four dimensional interval square you get a zero so probably I'll better write this down so you can see that okay your ds this away so you remember what what uh, d s square is it's actually uh eta mu nu dx mu dx nu and uh when uh when you write everything down this will give you actually this and uh, for the case of a uh, uh, photon you'll find that this is actually equals to zero So, for other than photon, this this part of the equation will be more than this part of the equation. For example, uh, a massive particle moving in space and time it will uh, traverse a particular distance, but that distance will be less than the distance covered by the uh, a photon. Essentially, in that particular case, for massive particle, your ds squared is essentially less than zero, which uh, connects back to the thing that we had earlier. Uh, Suppose that uh, this is instead of a mu, you have x mu, which is the position vector. Then the position vector of massive particle will be a time like. What else to learn in, in, in this particular uh, lesson is to talk about tensor equations. One of the good things about Tensors, uh, you have to remember that tensors are essentially uh, geometric objects. The components may change, but the geometric object stays the same. So in other words, if, if you find in a particular frame that the components are all zero, then when you do the transformation law to another frame, you will still find that all the components will be zero. And this is good when you consider the case uh, when you have an equation something like this, you can pretty, uh, make it pretty sure that this equation holds in all frames. Because I can define, for example, go back. Drawing one. So remember, we had uh, 
remove this. So this. So remember we had something like this t mu mu equals to s mu mu. So what we can do is to define another uh, tensor, say uh, say v uh, mu mu. And that tensor is essentially uh, obtained from T mu nu minus S mu nu. Now, if this is actually zero because of this equation in one particular frame, then you will find that in other frames as well, that this is going to be zero. In other words, that means T mu dash mu dash equals to S mu dash mu dash in other frames. Okay, so that's one of the uh, good things to, to write down these tensor equations. Yeah. This is what I said earlier. Okay, and uh, the other things that we probably might want to see is the fact that. Uh, when you have a second rank tensor, there's a possibility of uh, dividing the tensor into two parts. Uh, if it behaves in, in this manner, then we say it's an, uh, symmetric. Or if it behaves in this manner, then we say it's uh, anti-symmetric. But you can also have a general tensor, say T, down here, t mu nu can be written as the following. Oops. So you can see that this part is essentially a symmetric tensor and this part is essentially an anti-symmetric tensor. So one can always use this particular fact later on. And you can do this for any, any uh, for, uh, whether it's contravariant or covariant. Okay. But for Mixed tensor, one has to be a bit more careful because the symmetry can be uh, destroyed by the Lorentz transformation. Remember that Lorentz transformation might change the, the temporal component. Now, uh, the idea of symmetry, symmet symmetric tensor and anti-symmetric tensor can be generalized for higher order tensors, provided you, you uh, what you call limit yourself to either covariant or contravariant. Okay. Because I have, as, as I've said earlier, mixed tensor might be a bit more trickier. So uh, a completely symmetric tensor will be a tensor that actually you can interchange any pair of indices and they give you the same thing. And Anti-symmetric tensor, if we interchange any pair, it will give a minus sign, minus sign. And if we change two pairs, then you get a plus sign, and again, and so on and so forth. There's a, a notation that people use uh, that one can actually symmetrize uh, rank N tensor by uh, doing this, uh, you, so you start doing all, all permutations of your, 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 your indices over here. So remember that initially is the original uh, ordering is mu1 until mu n, but you can permute the 1 and n here to other numbers. And you sum over all this permutation and 
divide this by the number of permutations that's available, which is n factorial, then uh, essentially we symmetrize this tensor. And the notation for a symmetrized tensor is a bracket. In a similar way, you can do anti symmetrization, a completely anti symmetrization. The difference here, when you do the permutation, you need to make sure when it's an even permutation, you get a plus sign. When you have an uh, odd permutation, you get a minus sign. Okay. And a completely anti symmetrized tensor will have this notation with a square bracket. So this is a commonly used notation in special relativity and also general relativity. Finally, let's go to what we know as an alternating tensor. In the past, we had the liwa shivita tensor in Euclidean geometry. So we define the same thing. Instead of i, j, k running from 1 to 3, now we have uh, the Greek indices mu nu rho sigma uh, running from 1, 2, 3, and 4, okay, including the temporal component. So if it's uh, even permutation, we can define it as plus 1 and odd permutation minus 1 and 0 otherwise. Okay. But now let's use this in, in an equation that we know from matrices. Okay. Uh, when you combine with matrices over here, say in this case, it will be the Lorentz matrices. What we'll get essentially, uh, this will be changed to a new basis. Okay. So this will be the new, in, in terms of the new basis, multiplied by the determinant of the, the Lorentz transformation. So in other words, this new alternating tensor that we have introduced under proper Lorentz transformation when the uh, determinant of the Lorentz matrix is plus one, then your alternating tensor transforms like tensor. Otherwise, when you include reflection as for example, you allow negative determinant, then it will become what we call a pseudo tensor. And uh, another thing that we can actually do is to define the race index version. Okay, and uh, this can be done easily since we know how to uh, raise an index using the inverse metric. So you you have four copies of your inverse metric contracted with your uh, alternating tensor previously. But you can see from this, uh, remember that your ethers are actually uh, a diagonal matrix. So one of these eta will actually run to the, the, the fourth component, eta 4, 4, which is a minus 1. So in other words, what will happen in this particular case will be uh, give you a minus sign. So in other words, there's a, a difference in this particular case for your alternating tensor in the upper index with your lower index. So in this particular case, then it will be something like this. If it's even permutation, it will be minus one. If it's odd permutation, it will be plus one and zero out. Finally, I want to give an example of an uh, anti-symmetric tensor that we will probably use later on, which is essentially uh, uh, related to electrodynamics. If you remember in uh, electrodynamics, your magnetic field and electric uh, sorry about that, your electric field and magnetic field is actually interrelated. So if you give uh, a motion to an, a, a magnetic field, then you can actually introduce current, for example. Okay. So over here, both electric and magnetic fields can be combined into a, a second rank tensor in this following way. 
We will use this much later on. And you can see that this uh, tensor is actually uh, anti-symmetric tensor. Or in this case, it's a, a skew-symmetric matrix. Now you can see that, okay, if we look at, uh, if we look at this column, for example, this is the fourth column, but first row, second row, third row, that correspond to your electric field. So in this particular case, your electric field is given by these components. But for your magnetic field, it's a bit more complicated because uh, it goes into this upper triangle thing or lower triangle thing, but you still see a pattern to this. So the first component of your magnetic field comes from F23, your second one it comes from 31, and third one from 12. You can see this index 123, 231, 312 are just cyclic permutation. And you can check for yourself that looking at this particular uh, what you call pattern, then you can actually write your magnetic field as uh, the alternating tensor, the spatial part, uh, multiplying the field, uh, the field strength tensor that we have just introduced. We can also introduce the idea of a dual. Okay, so what's the idea of a dual? Is to multiply the uh, what you call, okay first of, first and foremost you can raise this index of your f menu become that and the do the dual is essentially just a contraction of the raise index with the alternating tensor so this object is essentially the dual of the previous object earlier on the difference here is just this uh, asterisk. Okay. Now, what's the use of this? You'll be able to, to just look at, look at all the components and you'll find that, okay, uh, in this particular case, uh, your F1 to star will be related to your F43. And remember that F43 or F3 minus F34 is essential electric field. But F12 is somewhere uh, in in the uh, what you call triangular uh, part. And similarly, we can do the rest. And what's going to happen? Let me just end it here. You will see that your magnetic field gets swapped. Uh, your electric field previously this is the electric field it gets swapped with the magnetic field and previously this over here the tri triangle over here is your magnetic field now it gets swapped with your electric field and the dual operation is essentially saying that from electric field you just change it to b the magnetic field and from your magnetic field you just change it to the minus of electric field so essentially, that gives you an example of an anti-symmetric tensor, and that concludes my lesson for now. Thank you.